Another quite popular counterexample to the utilitarian theory is due to Robert Nozick, and is known as the utility monster. Imagine a hypothetical being which receives much more utility from any resource it consumes than anyone else. Performing a bit of utilitarian calculus, it would quickly follow that all the resources should then be given to this creature, that we call the utility monster. In fact, we are supposing that he gains more happiness than any other suffering having no resources would cause anyone else. So in this case, the utilitarian framework indicates that the moral action is to give all the resources to a single being. This appears like an abysmal result. What does the utilitarian theory have to say for itself? Well, it is quite apparent that the setting is rather abstract. As described, one would be led to categorize this example as belonging to the class of the sometimes called impossible counterexamples. In fact, one of the most important and influential moral philosophers of the late 20th century, Derek Parfit, was somewhat critical of the utility monster, writing that we cannot test a moral principle by applying it to a case which we cannot even imagine. Parfit will then go on to produce the repugnant conclusion that poses some other questions to the utilitarian theory, but that is a topic for another video. In any case, as usual, with the so called impossible counterexamples, we have a very important first line of defense, which is that we can't accept them as counterexamples to our utilitarian framework because they don't belong to our universe. So the utility monster is immediately rejected. But we will not stop here and we will provide a possible additional counter argument. First, a quick parenthesis, since we often talk about the abstractness of the counterexamples. The stance of not accepting impossible or idolized counterexamples as defeaters of a moral theory is not a fringe position. Arguably, the greatest moral philosopher of the 20th century, John Rawls, also rejected abstract counterexamples. He even went as far as wondering if constructing a moral theory for all possible worlds is meaningful as an endeavor completely shutting the door to any kind of conceptual objection that could not be replicated in the real world. In this video, we won't take a stance on whether it makes sense or not to build a moral theory valid in all possible abstract worlds. We limit ourselves in refusing unrealistic settings, even though we will attempt to provide additional rebuttals when possible, like now. So okay, the utility monster is an abstraction, but could we refute it in a different way? Let's catch another possible rebuttal that allows one to remain within the utilitarian framework to vanquish the utility monster. To do so, we will need to refine the definition of utility. Indeed, in our framework, we utilize eudaimonia as our measure of utility. And we know from the research in positive psychology, the scientific study of what enables an individual to thrive, that a number of factors correlate with eudaimonia. Of course, the totality of what comprises a fruitful life is still scientifically out of our grasp, and it is a matter of refining the definition. But we are quite sure that a certain amount of wealth, having a meaning, working on personal strengths, not being pressured or coerced, and so on and so on, are all importantly connected with eudaimonia. A way to formalize these notions is to consider the definition of eudaimonia as a huge multivariable function with many components, each component being in a relationship to eudaimonia. Taking the exemplifications just cited, the components could be the meaningfulness of the life one is living, freedom, the amount of wealth, etc. For instance, if the amount of meaningfulness increases, keeping all other variables fixed, then eudaimonia would also increase. And positive psychology would study how these components aid or not in increasing eudaimonia. Sometimes utilitarians consider individual well-being to be able to increase indefinitely. In other words, they may say that the range of a eudaimonic function goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. In our framework, we will instead cap utility from above. This is a choice but we believe it aligns better with most people's intuitions regarding eudaimonia. In other words, we are saying that individual eudaimonia can't increase forever. Now, by capping eudaimonia, the utility monster immediately loses a lot of its power. 
Since if utility can't increase indefinitely, he would no longer consume all of the resources, because at a certain point he would reach the upper limit of how much happiness one can have. This showcases how working directly with the definition of eudaimonia can help in mitigating the problem posed by the utility monster. These kinds of refinements of the characterization of utility are somewhat of an underutilized feature of the utilitarian theory. They bring a certain richness to the framework and allow for diverse variants of utilitarianism. Indeed, some might call this limiting of a possible happiness while leaving the negative utility one can experience unbounded a form of prioritarianism. That is, a utilitarian moral framework that does not weigh the well-being of all individuals equally. Since an individual in a great amount of suffering could have a higher magnitude of negative utility than one experiencing great happiness. Although we will still call ourselves utilitarians, since these departures from the canonical theory are probably too small to warrant a different name. Then again, call the framework what you wish. Enough with these details, we still have an issue. Indeed, we haven't really defeated the idea behind the utility monster just yet. One could in fact steal man the utility monster counterexample and suppose there were many utility monsters. Then, by increasing the number of utility monsters, since they are the most efficient at quote-unquote converting resources into eudaimonia, at some point the utilitarian calculus would yet again tell us that all the resources should be given to the large number of utility monsters, and none to the humans. This gets to the fact that the utilitarian theory may appear to allow extreme disparities in wealth as already discussed in our video on the slave society counterexample. So how could we get rid of these objections entirely? If one is really scared of cases of utmost material imbalance occurring, there is a way to banish them for good while retaining the essence of the utilitarian theory. And that is by defining eudaimonia as having negative second partial derivative with respect to wealth. That is, by imposing in the definition of utility the law of diminishing marginal utility. This operation consists of taking a law that describes an empirical phenomenon, the law of diminishing marginal utility, and assuming it as a part of a utilitarian model, incorporating what is an observed occurrence directly in the theoretical apparatus of utilitarianism. In this way, a utilitarian framework with such a definition of utility will support an egalitarian repartition of wealth between all humans. This is due to the well-known fact that if the law of diminishing marginal utility is true, then any transfer of wealth from the rich to the poor will, ceteris paribus, increase the total utility until equality is reached. So there you have it, under this particular utilitarian model, it does not matter if the utility monsters have four times the serotonin in the brain of a human per unit resource or claim that they would be happier. They would be given the same amount of resources as anyone else, because by definition, that is how this specific utility works. Okay, quite nice. So with this we have given another way to defeat the utility monster, and we invite anyone who would abandon the utilitarian framework for fear of supporting extreme levels of inequality to think about adopting a similar definition of utility instead. For what concerns our framework, even if we do bound individual utility from above, we do not choose to impose directly the law of diminishing marginal utility in the definition of eudaimonia, because we believe it to be superfluous given that, as John Rawls would say, we are constructing a theory appropriate for the natural human world as we know it, where the law of diminishing marginal utility is a stylized fact. Now. There is more to be said on inequality. In particular, an extra thing to consider that is sometimes overlooked is how much utility one creates for other people given a certain amount of resources. Yes, not for oneself, but for others. We will see that this leads to some interesting implications. But this is not the video for these reflections, so we leave it at this, happy to have discussed the utility monster and ready to continue our journey.